My name is Don Vitee Pongo. Once again, you're watching Image Maker, and my guest is none other than GLC, Leonard GLC Harris, an artist uh, who, who signed was just, just made history. He made history twice this year in Chicago, which we'll get into the second time. Uh, <laughs> in the previous segment, we talked about uh, the, the landmark sign, historic sign, welcoming people to the community of Inglewood. But also, uh, we went into talking about the, the significance of libations and the influences of Malcolm X. And I made some parallels between who you are and who Malcolm X was as far as, uh, you know, going from Red to Malcolm X to El Malik Shabazz to, mm -hmm. you put me on to his other name, what was Omo his other name? Omowale. Omowale, yeah. uh, when he went to Nigeria. Yeah. And uh, you have uh, evolved in the same way, especially as it relates to your name, GLC. Now, what does GLC stand for, man? Well, GLC once stood for the Gangster Legendary Crisis. It was pretty much a summary of my life story. Uh, I lost my father when I was eight months due to a heart attack. It was his third heart attack and he had it while he was driving and crashed, you know. Uh, then I lost my mom when I was 12, but in the middle of that I lost uncles and other relatives. Um, by the time I was 18, we had buried like about 16 of my friends mm. in the community, community that I lived in. Then I ended up losing my house in a fire. Uh, it was a lot of things that people would look at and be like, wow, that's wow. a crisis. Right. Because a crisis is a critical situation which uh, entails you to be on your P's and Q's. You got to be on it during a crisis. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of like what my whole life was. And um, I wanted to take the negative connotation of a crisis and show that, hey, I'm a crisis survivor. Because I left out when I was 14, I was diagnosed with diabetes. You almost died. I died and came back. I was pronounced legally dead. Really? I coded. I was out of here. Wow. Well, I was resuscitated. I just don't give all the, um, the glory to the machines and the doctors. I give it to the most high. So I've been resurrected. Mm. And ain't nobody going to tell me different because I went on the other side and I'm here right now sitting here with you today. What did, what did you see? Were you, like, were you unconscious at the time that you died? What did, what did you see? What happened? Break, break it down from beginning to end, man. Yeah, diabetes at 14. Uh, so what I learned from uh, holistic health practices is that the pancreas is an organ that um, it reacts a certain way to depression or to sorrow or sadness. I lost my mom, and then two and a half years later, I was in the hospital with a pancreas that didn't work. Mm. I was depressed every day, as well as malnutrition. Uh, my mom, she cooked every day, and I thought I was eating good, and she thought I was eating good, but my diet mainly consisted of starch and corpse. You know, like, mm -hmm. you think you mm -hmm. eat good because you ate a steak with some macaroni and cheese yeah, and some yeah. rice. And it's a home-cooked meal. You would think that that was healthy for you. Yeah, my mama could throw down. But the thing was, all the stuff that I was eating, the majority of it, it all turned into acid in, in my body. And uh, an acidic environment is the perfect environment for illness or diseases or oh, viruses wow. to flourish. Wow. So I was depressed, and then I was dealing with, um, you know, malnutrition, and hence diabetes was there. Wow, wow, yeah. wow. So during that experience, when I flatlined, I, I just remember having an out-of-body experience. I saw my two siblings, two sisters, two brothers, so four siblings standing at the foot of the bed looking at, looking at me laying there and they was crying. I'm in the room in the cut looking like, how is they looking at me? And I'm like, right there, but I'm right here too. And I look over to the side and I saw my mom standing in the same room. And it's the same hospital that she made transition in. So, man, I'm a believer in the ancestors. I'm a believer in the most high. And I'm a believer in, man, uh, resurrection because I experienced it. So, yeah, that was a crisis, too. But I wasn't going to let the crisis get the best of me. So I took the word crisis and I decided that I was going to redefine it. Because words only have power based upon uh, who, who dictates the power. Mm -hmm. Like the most powerful thing that a man can say to another man is, let me tell you a story because he who tells the story controls the narrative. He controls the fate of all the characters involved. So I was like, yeah, crisis is this, crisis is that. I'm gonna redefine it and I'm gonna show kids that you can go through all this negativity and you can still come out on top. Mm -hmm. So that was back then. But since I've grown and developed, I really don't wanna be referred to as a gangster no mm -hmm. more because mm -hmm. I, I see the world a lot different. So now I've evolved to simply gotta love Chicago. 
<laughs> gotta it. love it. Gotta, gotta love show it. love. You know That's what I'm saying? It. That's gotta it. love it. We talked about growth and development, and before that, we're talking about you becoming a member of an organization that, you know, how did you, first of all, why this is so fascinating to me is because, as we'll get into, um, your brother Baba Kwesi, mm -hmm. holding Kwanzaa ceremonies right down 72nd, right in the same home where you saw shots flying, but even having that instilled in you at an early age didn't keep you out of the streets. Well, the thing was, uh, as a child, you know, a lot of times when you're disciplined and you're told what not to do, we usually do the opposite, exactly. only because the risk factor, it's the thrill, you know, like, man, I don't think I'm going to get caught, you know what I'm saying, but yeah. it's just the adrenaline going, and when you get caught, and then your brother pull out that red paddle, because he was a capital, and he uh -huh. was like, with me with it, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> that right there kind of detoured me, like, okay, I probably need to be a bit more civilized, so I didn't stop being in the streets, I just got a lot slicker about it, right, and, right, the, and right. the thing is, I appreciated the culture, but at a young age, I really didn't see the effect that all this history on Africa, what did it have to do with me in this present state that I was in? Mm. When I'm going outside and I'm seeing dead bodies and I'm holding one of my guys up until the ambulance come and I'm calling on the ancestors, but my people were still getting shot and all this crazy stuff was going on. Right, right. right. I didn't understand until I uh, began to walk in the path of the ancestors that the change will come. Because we always ask for change, but I found that the change that I wanted to see had to begin with me. Mm -hmm. So I further embraced the teachings of my brother, and here I am today, being an agent of change, and a, a man who shows love, prosperity, you know? Well, we keep referencing your brother, but we haven't even called on him properly. He's talking about uh, Ronald Quasey Harris, who, uh, man, so I can't even remember when I first met him, because he's one of those people that you meet and you feel like you met him before. <laughs> you know, he, he's yeah. also uh, Kwesi, I pronounce mine Kwesi, but we both Sunday born. Yes, sir. And, uh, he, and you know, when I told him I was from Ghana, he started speaking tree to me, his, his, his tree's probably better than mine, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> and we, we, we're having a conversation and, and initially he cuffed me and, and, and just, just told me how much he believed in me. I was early on at, um, WVON and we was doing doing uh, events at Chicago State University. This is even before the financial crisis going on at Chicago State University, just yeah. before it. And he was just so proud, like you said, that I had the, the, the power to tell our stories and to tell them in truth. So every time I went somewhere, he would talk about the ma'at with me. He would talk about, we would just have these deep conversations about what that meant. Then I found out that that's something that he that represented his life. He did that with Timbo, yeah. the African American Male Resource Center up at Chicago State University. Talk about who Quasey was and what he means to you and the city of Chicago. Oh man, my brother, he was truly a beacon of light, man. There were a lot of uh, And I know it was your brother. He was so humble. He know everybody. He know Lupe. He know you either related to you. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, yeah. Beacon of light. Yeah, he was he was simply a beacon of light, man. He he was one of the most humble and modest guys that I've ever met in my life. And he would always say that he is simply the sum total of everything that came before him. He instilled in me and he walked in the same path. He said that we are only here because we stand on the shoulders of the elders and the ancestors that came before us. Mm. And he walked with that and he was like, yo, Man, uh, when it was time to vote, he'd be like, vote. Why vote, man? They don't have no, we don't have no control. Now your ancestors died for that. Mm -hmm. Vote. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, he, he went to war against the tobacco industry, against Philip Morris. If you notice, you don't see cigarettes being advertised in the black community on billboards and stuff no more. So how did, how did, he, how did he fight he against that? He teamed up with Lisa Madigan and a few other revolutionaries that were under the, uh, the same act of uh, Uhuru Sasa, Freedom Now for the people. And with that being said, man, they uh, went to the government, to the legislation, and they had a lawsuit against this tobacco industry. And man, they came out victorious. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, he, it's rich history. He, he was an agent of change because he understood that when a person is at war with you, they could drop bombs and have guns and do all that. That's one way. But a better way for them to get you is silent. They can mm -hmm. get it through the food and through the things that you consume, like cigarettes. They got tar right. and rat poison on it and this mm -hmm. and that. So that's what just that. Yeah, and alcohol, which kills your liver and your kidneys, you know, yeah, they get yeah. you like that, a slow death, uh -huh. as opposed to walking up in the streets, executing. So he fought against that, you know what I'm saying? And with Timbo at Chicago State, that was teaching and educating men of black origin. And what he did in his time there, which was only six years, 
he took the African American male graduation uh, percentage from five percent to twenty five percent. These this is his a historic feat that he did wow. up there. And also he had the highest African American male student retention rate in the whole state of Illinois. That's amazing, man. That's yeah. amazing. That's amazing too because I, I, I was a, a teacher at a program at SIUE, uh, Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. We had, it was called Goal Oriented African American Males Excel. Okay. And I had gone the game program and I had gone through that program and our numbers weren't looking like that. Okay. okay. <laughs> but no, but we had, it, it, was, it was amazing. We had about 20 boys and uh, they had the female, uh, females of African descent, modeling excellence was the fame program. Yeah. And, and I didn't know that there were other universities doing that because technically Chicago State is like our HBCU but it's really a PWI yeah. and his program allowed for there to be an HBCU and a black enclave within the structure of that institution so it's truly a testament to who he was. How, how did he uh, finally transition? What was it? Well he made transition um, out of the physical form into the spiritual realm uh, last year. It was kind of crazy though because a few years back he was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer Mm -hmm. But the crazy part about it is he had went to the doctor a year prior and there was nothing wrong. Really? And then his cancer came just out of nowhere. And when he was diagnosed, he was at 70% mm -hmm. in his body. Mm -hmm. And they gave him three months to live. But my brother wasn't going. He was a spiritual man. Yes. He was a powerful man. And he was a man of discernment, uh, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, integrity. And the man who gave me the game to save my life at an early age, I was able to give him game at an older age to prolong his, as far as the holistics approach. And then Mama J, and then the other people of the community, they all came together because we weren't trying to lose the leader. Let's talk about that, man. We're talking to GLC in the next segment. We go deeper into uh, health, Baba Kwesi. I also want to go back into your music career, man. You're watching Image Makers from Doma T. Pongo.